Uh, hello, my name is David Lowe, and I am the band director at Canyon Intermediate School. I'm starting my seventh year uh, and in that position at Canyon, and uh, I wanted to make this video to try to share some of my uh, process and my philosophy about how to teach beginning brass and uh, getting those students, especially on high brass, uh, started on trumpet and French horn. And all the stuff that I'm going to talk about on this video can be used on any brass instrument. Um, but the ones that I've been using it with for, for several years now are the trumpet and the French horn classes. Um, so I hope that this video is helpful to you and uh, makes your students better. The, the scope of this video will be talking about the very, very beginning uh, of the school year and the approach that I use uh, helping students to kind of have a good mentality towards playing their instrument as well as just physically getting them started playing on their first sounds on their instrument. Um, I use a sequence of steps that I teach them from just like the very first minutes of the school year up through producing their first sounds and uh, even a little bit past that I'm going to talk about articulation and I'm also going to be talking about um, moving vertically pitch wise. I want to share some terminology that I use uh, as well as give you some tricks and tips on uh, dealing with common issues that, that I've dealt with and that I see sometimes students struggling with uh, when they're starting out making their first sounds. The, the idea is that good sound facilitates everything that they're going to do. Articulation, pitch accuracy, uh, lip flexibility, tuning, range, endurance, and a million other aspects of playing the instrument. That all stems from how they create a sound. Um, not just creating a sound, which and, and which I would say is a noise. Just creating a noise is not the goal. Creating a beautiful sound that is functional and able to do all those things that we want them to down the road, that's what we want them to be able to do. And setting them up at the beginning properly is absolutely vital. I don't want to roll the dice um, just by putting a mouthpiece on their on their face and telling them, okay, make a buzz, and then they they do all the things that that we're afraid of them doing. Um, I think that they deserve a better start than that, and I, th I think we can give them a better start than that. We want to give them a progressive series of really easy steps that have attainable goals. Okay, so the first thing that I make sure that we establish right from the beginning is perfect posture. The way that they sit is going to affect how they breathe, and the way that they breathe is going to affect how they play big time. Um, okay, so the second thing is breathing. Um, when we're breathing, I'm always using the gauge. and I call it the gauge. So we have the hand out in front. Let me kind of get where you can see that. Hand is straight out in front. And it is, is um, their visual representation. They're showing me what their air is doing. At first, we don't do it with any, any kind of counts going on. We just breathe in slowly and we exhale slowly. The things that we're trying to achieve with this is maximum amount of air movement. We're trying to completely fill up our lungs. We're trying to completely get rid of all of the air in our lungs for now, at least. When we start playing, it'll change a little bit, but for now, that's what we're trying to do. And what I'm trying to get them to understand and do is realize their limitations of how much air they can move in and how much air they can move out. Um, I don't say anything about the embouchure or the shape of their lips. I don't really care about that right now. What I do care about is the shape of the inside of their mouth um, when they're, whenever they're breathing. Of course, everything is relaxed. Chest is relaxed. Um, tummy is relaxed. The inside of the mouth should be an O shape, like, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, as tall and as surprised as we can possibly get. And the breath going in should have very, very little sound, should really have no sound if we're breathing slowly and relaxed. So we breathe in. We blow back out. The movement of air that the students are learning to establish and use whenever they play. Um, okay, let me look through my notes real quick. Creating an open wind tunnel where the air can move freely, that's our main goal. Um, I want the breathing to be maximum amount of air uh, possible at all times. This is the best way I've found to get them to really have energy with their air usage. Um, I'm always asking students questions, like I said, was that your maximum air? If they say no, 
okay, then let's try it one more time. Or, okay, then let's make sure, make sure it's better next time. That kind of stuff is really, really important. The idea of using maximum air is not quite as aggressive as saying, blow as hard as you possibly can because we create tension and then we have real problems. All right, so now we're gonna get into the, the toys, like the fun stuff that they're actually gonna be holding and doing. So we've established breathing, we've established good posture, they have this gauge going on and they're gonna be using this on most all of these steps that we're gonna be getting into here in a minute. The first tool that we're going to use um, to help teach them really good habits of air usage and starting to form the shape of our inside of our mouth when we play as well as the embouchure is a McDonald's straw. Um, I like the McDonald's straw the best of the ones that I've tried because it's a large size, it's a thick size straw. So the first thing that we do, we just call it McDonald's straw and the students are responsible for keeping up with this just like they would their valve oil, mouthpiece, instrument, book, whatever they've got. This is now part of their equipment and I go ahead and give them this. The advantage of using this is that it's cheap, it's replaceable, um, it's not very durable but they're they're free if you buy a sausage biscuit and throw a few extra straws in the bag um, which I may or may not have done before. The first thing that we do with this is we're using the same exact breathing as we did before and I want to I want to really emphasize that it's the same exact breathing that we're using we're just doing it through a tube now. Now there's an important thing that I want them, them to do we make sure that they're holding this straw with a finger and a thumb I tell them hold it like a flower and so they hold it like a flower and then I make sure that they understand that the left hand holds the holds the thing that we're doing the right hand is using the gauge whenever we're breathing and that establishes continuity through all of our steps that we're doing. So left hand holds, right hand gauges. We're going to put this inside of our mouth and it's going to sit on top of our tongue so it needs to go decently far into our mouth and that, of course we make sure that they're not going to choke themselves or gag themselves with this thing but it goes into their mouth, sits on top of their tongue. Okay. This guarantees that the airway has a straight path because we're blowing through this straight tube. It's got a straight path from the, the top, right on top of our tongue where the air is going, all the way out into the room. It helps keep the tongue low in the mouth because we've got something sitting on top of it. It ensures that we're not going to get those kids with their tongues really high up in their mouth because that can, that can establish a really pinchy airflow and, of course, a pinchy tone after that. Um, it helps with the teeth being open. We make sure that they're not biting down at all. That's something that we talk about, too. So the teeth are sitting on top, top teeth on top, bottom teeth on bottom. Um, and it also does something else really, really important. It aligns the hole between your teeth, between the student's teeth, and their lips. Because if that hole is not aligned, they're going to end up having a weirdly directed airflow. Their top lip will get too high, and then their bottom lip will come up to it, and now their top teeth are in the way. And they try to blow through that, and they get this where the airflow doesn't go through. And what we want is where the airflow can go easily. I don't know if you can see that very well, but that's what we're trying to establish is an airflow that is nice and open and aligned from the top of our tongue all the way out into the room. Okay, so the time I'm going to demonstrate. So we breathe in and we blow out maximum air. So here I go. I'm not too worried about what the lips are doing at this point as long as they're just closing together. And um, what I might say, uh, one of the main things that I, that I say when we're doing this step for the first time is your lips close like a Muppet. So a Muppet's lips don't go, they don't like, they don't close like a drawstring bag. They just close up and down because they just have a hinge for a jaw. And that's what your lips do too. And that way we're establishing that the lips are flat across and we're also establishing the aperture already. But this is kind of acting as a tool to get us to do that. So if you see this, that's a big that's a big red flag. Their lips are closing like a drawstring bag. And we don't want that. We want the lips to close like a Muppet. Okay? Um, <laughs> and we have fun talking about that one too. Um, or laughing about it at least. So, the straw. Here's a cool um, bonus round that you can do with this one if you have these, um, is you can get these cool little pinwheels. They can see what their air is doing, and now that they have a straw, they have an easy way to direct it. And so they can see, okay, weak air, here we go. 
and I don't know if you can hear that, but you can barely hear the fins spinning. Whereas fast maximum air, they get that sizzle and that zzzz, and so they get to see their air really moving fast. Um, so these are worth getting. I think I got these like a like a bag of like 300 from uh, Great American Toy Company. I think that that's a, probably a fun thing for them to be able to do, and it also shows them the speed that their air is moving out. Um, and I'm not blowing as hard as I can either, um, but but it's if you can get that sizzle going, you know that they're moving some air at a pretty good rate of speed, um, and you know because they're blowing through the tube and it's sitting on top of their their tongue that they've got an open airway. There's there's they're establishing what that feels like. The mantra that we're always talking about it's yes we're asking them are you using maximum air? Are you moving maximum air? Um, is your is the shape of your mouth an O shape? Oh, oh uh, breathing in. Are we doing those kinds of things? Yeah, but the mantra that we're constantly talking about is one that is a checklist for them to be thinking about, and that is open, steady, loud. And if you don't like the word loud, or if you don't like any of those words, that's fine. Uh, a word that's good instead of loud is full. So open, steady, full. And you ask them, okay, you just blew on your McDonald's straw. So you got your left hand, hold it like a flower. You got your gauge. They can hear the wind coming out of it. Um, even with a class of 30 kids, they can hear the wind moving through. And you can ask them, okay, the sound of the wind, was it open? Well, yes, obviously, because we're blowing through a tube and we've got an open wind tunnel. Was it steady? And then they can start thinking, okay, you hear those kids with the air that kind of diminishes. And does that kind of thing just like deflates and it kind of goes slower towards the end. So we want to avoid that. We want it to be steady air all the way to the end um, from the beginning to the end of the note without diminishing. So steady, that's what steady means. And then loud, is it loud? No, that's not loud. If you can hear the wind tunnel, then you know that it's loud and they, they can hear what loud sounds like on each step but this is the quietest one probably. So open, steady, loud, or if you like, open, steady, full. I, I use both and we talk about both because you're not always going to play loud sounds, but you can play with full sounds even at soft dynamics. Um, that's for later though, but but there you go, there it is. Um, and the thing about the this, all of these steps, actually every single one of these steps, it's so easy because every single kid can do it um, and they can do it properly very quickly it takes them a couple of tries and you have to you might have to say well no hold hold it like this and you'll have kids that want to point their straw up like this and they'll want to just do this and, and they'll do that and so you have to establish what the expectations are obviously but you want to make sure that the the straw is pointed straight out or slightly down i like slightly down most kids have an overbite and so slightly down works better on their embouchure but we should almost never have a, a straw that's pointed upwards in a case of a student with an extreme uh, underbite, that might be something you consider, but in general, we wanna be straight out or slightly down, never up and not extremely down, okay? So anyways, that's another good thing about the straws that you can see where their air is, is kind of pointed and they can start thinking, okay, my trumpet's probably gonna point this way too. Um, okay, so they're experiencing quick success on easy tasks. Um, it's stupid easy. Like all the steps, stupid easy. So we're gonna go on to the next stupid easy step here in just a second. So the next step is the PVC pipe visualizer and I just call it the visualizer. And all it is is a, a half inch PVC pipe coupler. The one that's closest to a trumpet rim and closest to a French horn rim without being too small. We do not wanna use one that's too small. Slightly bigger is okay, but I believe this is a half inch. and. Uh, PVC pipe couplers, and you can find them at a hardware store. Um, the ones in our, our town are about 20 cents each. Easy to get a class set for yourself. They're dishwasher safe so you can wash them. Um, all that kind of stuff. So anyways, really durable, really easy, but the big thing is what you can use them for. Uh, I think I'm going to use the white one because it'll show up better. So this is, this is the same thing as a mouthpiece as far as the kids are concerned, but they don't know that. 
The idea is that we're starting to get them into these habits of playing the instrument properly without even knowing that they're doing it. It's really similar to the Mr. Miyagi school of teaching. If you ever watched um, the Karate Kid, he's got Daniel out there, the kid in the Karate Kid. He's out there and he's waxing the car. Wax on, wax off, wax on, wax off. And at the end of the movie, he's got to use those moves to block, wax on, wax off. And he's able to do those things. I'll keep working on my karate skills. But anyways, he's using those moves and he didn't even know that he was learning them at the time. And that's my whole concept behind, behind all of this is they're accidentally learning really good habits that they can just plug into the trumpet later um, that you can rely on. And you can say, hey, remember, the, remember this one step? You need to do this one step better on your trumpet. And so they're able to do that. Um, so anyway, this is the next step. So what we do is I actually go around on this since we're actually finding where the mouthpiece rim is going to end up sitting. And I go to every student and I double check and make sure that we're putting it halfway in between the corners. Uh, yeah, there we go. Halfway in between the corners and halfway with the top lip and halfway with the bottom lip. I do teach about 50% in the mouthpiece and you can see that. Okay, so the advantage to this thing is they can see what their lips look like on the inside. They also can see what my lips look like on the inside and they can like copy that. Um, but they need to, need to look in a mirror, so you're gonna need some mirrors in your class or you need to make some kind of assignment where you can make sure that they're doing that. <coughs> but it's really important that they make sure that they are halfway between the corners and halfway on top, halfway on bottom. This is talking about trumpet, by the way, sorry. If you're doing French horn, you're actually gonna make sure that you're mostly like two thirds top lip and one third bottom lip. I should have established that. Um, so I'm kind of coming at it from a trumpet angle, I guess. So anyways, it's different for which instrument you're teaching uh, or what you prefer, but you can, you can get that where you want it to be and you put it there and you let the kid feel where it is and then you have them find it again and you make sure that it's the same place because they'll end up putting it, coach, nothing's happening, okay? And so we gotta make sure that they're finding the same place every single time and they start getting in that good habit. Now, what do you do with this thing? Well, you do exactly what you were doing with the other stuff, with the breathing and with the McDonald's straw. You breathe in and you blow air out. At this point, I still haven't talked about the shape of the embouchure. What we're talking about is air and the, the, the fluidity of the air movement, breathing in through an O shape, using maximum air, blowing out through an O shape, using maximum air. Now, when they start watching me and what I'm doing, they start copying what I'm doing most of the time. And what I'm, I'm doing is I'm getting the top lip where my mustache would be, or is, <laughs> I need a shave. The mustache is flat, sitting flat against my teeth. And that's what I'm thinking about. The corners of my mouth are giving my teeth a gentle hug and that sets the corners. And then the last thing is that the red part of my lip, I'm making sure that it's not pooched out and it's not uh, curled out. We don't want this. So we want flat and we wanna hide just a little bit of the red part of the lip. Um, what I tell, here are some things that I tell them. Um, this sometimes can just solve the whole thing. If you just tell them, hey, our air is gonna blow through a paper thin flat hole. And if you watch this, I'll try to get close. Okay, so the hole that we're blowing through needs to be a paper thin flat hole. And it also establishes the idea that air is how we're gonna make our sound and not buzz. I've never said the word buzz in class and I never will. It's an illegal word for a trumpet or a French horn class. I do not say buzz because I think vibration is a way more appropriate word that actually describes what we're trying to create on our instrument, okay? So um, vibration, not buzz. The lips are starting to form the embouchure. We're blowing through a flat paper thin hole. Most of the time, that's almost gonna get them exactly where they need to be. Uh, to be able to make their sound. And they've already established that the hole between their teeth and the hole between their lips is the same hole, it's the same alignment. And you watch out for that because you'll see and you'll see kids pushing their bottom lip up or you'll see kids really pulling their top lip down and doing weird things. Um, so you want it to all be aligned. I talk about having the flat mustache. My mustache is flat against my teeth as opposed to pooched out like 
I'm going to kiss my grandma. Flat, pooched. We don't want pooched um, on high brass instruments at all. Um, I talk about maybe. I don't do all of these at once. I, I kind of address them as needed. Um, slightly curl the red of the top lip. And that also will help get the mustache flat. Like if you just try that and you just curl your lip just a little bit, it flattens everything out, or at least it does for me. So I'm assuming that it will work for some other people too. Um, hide the red a little. Close the lips like a Muppet, not like a drawstring bag. We already talked about that. And then the other one that's kind of fun is chipmunk. And you can tell them to do this. If they're really having trouble kind of getting the idea of curling their lip, you can go extreme. Excuse my crooked teeth. I'm always embarrassed about this. If I push this up, okay, and now I've got this, I'm going to let it slide down. It's curled under. I'm going to let it slide down to the bottom of my top teeth, or just even, or maybe a little below. And so we've got that chipmunk. And so we all do a trip chipmunk. And we have fun doing that one. So that's, that's chipmunking. And we keep the top lip flat, and we make sure that we can't see very much, if any, of the top teeth because we want that when we actually play a sound here in a little bit. Okay, the corners of the mouth give the teeth a gentle hug. I've already said that one. No duck lips. So, and ducks don't have lips, do they? I don't know, do they? They do in trumpet class. So no duck lips, which are out, and no kissy, kissy lips, okay? And we talk about kissing our grandma. Um, I say flat is where it's at. <clears throat> Everything is flat when we're playing the trumpet or the French, well, French horn is slightly different. I'm still approaching this from a trumpet mindset. French horn needs to be more relaxed. We're not as worried about the lips being curled and flat. So I probably should just call this a trumpet video. Okay, and we're still establishing that the air is open, steady, and full. Open, steady, full, or open, steady, loud. So let me demonstrate what this is supposed to look like. I'm still using my left hand. I'm using a finger and a thumb so that I can see their lips whenever they play. I can see their embouchure. They're looking straight ahead. They've got the gauge. They breathe in. And I can actually look down in there and I can see what their lips are doing. Let me show you what it looks like um, if they're buckling their lips or if they're doing like the duck lips thing like I was talking about. You'll see, um, you'll see this. And the lips are very, that's bad. That is not a good trumpet embouchure. They're gonna not be able to play low, uh, higher than like a low C without adjusting that. So what we wanna establish is a flat mustache, okay? Curly top lip, and it stays that way. They muppet closed, and we blow through a paper thin hole, okay? And I'm watching for that. This is an important step because they are getting their lips on something they're getting the red of their lips inside of something, which is something I forgot to mention. Make sure that we don't have any red protruding outside of the rim anywhere. Okay, and you'll see crazy stuff. You probably already have, but we need to make sure that they're not doing that. Everything is flat and everything fits inside the mouthpiece flat like that. You can see that paper thin hole. And that's what you're going for, okay? Um, all right, so that's the mouthpiece visualizer. Um, I call it the mouthpiece visualizer, and whenever I say students get out whatever, I call it the visualizer. You can call it whatever you want. You can call it Fred. Get out Fred. Okay, so the next couple of steps are gonna be pretty simple because it's just taking what we've already done and using the trumpet mouthpiece, uh, or you could use the French horn mouthpiece to do them. Okay, um, remember there are some slight differences between trumpet and French horn embouchures. That, that could be a totally different um, thing, uh, but, but generally the process is what we're trying to go for. We've got the mouthpiece. We're, what we're going to do is we're going to hold the mouthpiece by the throat, and we're going to do the same thing we did with the McDonald's straw, except it's not going to go on top of our tongue anymore. It's just going to go right past our teeth. So if these were my teeth, top teeth, bottom teeth, we're just gonna make sure that it's just about flush, maybe a little bit further in. And we're gonna do the same kind of thing. We're breathing in, we're blowing, but we're involving the mouthpiece, and so they're getting excited because we're doing more stuff with the actual equipment that they know they're gonna play with, but it's all already a skill that they've mastered. And we're, we're practicing, once again, we're practicing the breathing and the air movement. We're also practicing letting the lips muppet closed um, rather than drawstring bag closed. Um, 
and those things. So it's a lot of the same goals as when we were blowing on the McDonald's straw and when we were blowing on the, mount, the PVC visualizer. Okay, so here I go. I'm gonna put my teeth on top. Okay, I'm gonna breathe in. Now with it being a big tube, it is a little bit difficult to get everything completely flat. So, but the idea is that we're moving air through an open airway and that they're establishing that. You need to, and you need to really reinforce the idea that we're using maximum air, we're moving all of that air, and every step that we've done so far is all exactly the same, exactly the same. There's no different um, thing as we're just using different equipment, okay? All right, so now that we've done that, we're on to the next step. We're gonna take the mouthpiece that we were holding upside down and we're gonna flip it around and hold it like normal. Still using the left hand, but still try to keep that continuity of all the steps. Left hand is holding it like a flower. Right hand is still doing the gauge. Uh, so the, the thing we do is just like the, the PVC visualizer, we're going for the same goals and everything. We are not getting a vibration. Do not buzz on your mouthpiece. Buzzing is illegal, okay? Do not get any kind of vibration. We want them to be moving air still, and you'll see why when we do the next step, but no vibration, no vibration, okay? So lick the lips, we get the mouthpiece set, okay? We're still muppeting, like a, like a muppet, closing our lips. We're still, once we do that, we're gonna set the embouchure, then we're gonna open and breathe, then we blow. Okay, so our steps are the same, but we're starting to be more conscious about the, the shape of the embouchure and setting the embouchure before we start. So, flat mustache, curl the top lip, corners hug the teeth, okay? And we muppet the lips closed. So that happens first, then you breathe, then you blow. So here I go. There's no vibration, and we don't want there to be vibration because of the next step which we'll get into in a second. But as soon as we start creating vibration on the mouthpiece alone, we start introducing unnecessary tension in the lips and, and we don't want that. So there's that step. It's probably one of the most important steps because they're on the mouthpiece and they're not making a vibration. Let's go on to the next step and you'll see why. Okay, the next step is gonna involve a new tool. So we have, um, my wife found these online, uh, just like on Amazon, and you can just search for um, giant tea straws or boba tea straws, which is like a drink you can get at a lot of um, like Thai restaurants and stuff like that. But anyway, that's where we got the idea for this. And the great thing about this is it's very close to the um, same size as a lead pipe of a trumpet. And so what we're doing is we're actually putting on a plastic lead pipe onto the mouthpiece. This works for trumpet. You can use uh, other sizes of straws that fit cornet. Um, the Brahms straws work for a cornet shank and they fit over. Uh, Brahms straws also will fit French horn uh, shanks. This will fit trumpet. This will fit trombone and euphonium. Uh, this will go in, I think, hmm, I should test this, but I think this will fit inside a tuba mouthpiece. So instead of going around the top of it, it'll fit inside and it'll still accomplish the same goal. Um, but these are just plastic straws and you wanna find one that's close to the size of the lead pipe of whatever instrument you're dealing with. It's best if it can go over the top, oops, sorry, over the top rather than inside. Um, also, I should show you this, the McDonald's straw, which I've lost, there it is. The McDonald's straw will also go inside. You can see, so you can. there's an example of going inside the mouthpiece and that will still work but a larger size mouthpiece will give the student a more um, similar feel to what playing on the instrument is actually like. So here we go, here's the steps. So this is mouthpiece and one of the students um, named this the plastic trumpet. So <clears throat> you can call it whatever you want, but that's what we call it in our class. This is, so I say get out your mouthpiece and your plastic trumpet. Um, whenever I introduce this the first time, this is the cool thing that happens with this. And we'll talk about why this happens in a minute, but they're not creating a vibration. They're just blowing on their mouthpiece like they were a minute ago. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to add the straw to the to the mouthpiece here in a second and watch what happens. So 
So we have a vibration that happened and I didn't change anything about what I was doing. I was still blowing through that paper thin hole with no vibration. I asked the students what they think happened because they're almost always like, what? Like, how did you do that? It's always like magic to them. And so I asked them, what do you think happened? And so they know that I'm not cheating and creating a buzz on purpose. I'm doing everything exactly the same. And so usually there is one student in the room that goes, well, you added the tube. And so all the air got crammed into one space. And so that's made the lips start buzzing or vibrating or whatever they want to say. Um, and and um, I'm still not calling it a buzz. I'm going to call it a vibration. It vibrates. Okay. But what's happening, and I, I tell it to them like this, two ways. The air is coming out of our mouthpiece and it's going out into the room. And it's like the room is our trumpet. It's like the world's giantest trumpet ever. Okay. And we're blowing all of those air molecules into that room. Well, all the air molecules have lots of space to move around freely and they're, ah, oh, they've got all this room. But whenever we put the tube on top of it, all those air molecules get packed into a tightly, uh, uh, well, a tightly packed area. And so whenever we blow air through that tube, the energy of that air moving through the tube excites those air molecules and they start bouncing into each other and they're bumping off of each other and going everywhere and hitting each other and that starts to create a vibration and then we get a sound, okay? Now, you could tell me that the science is all wrong, but that's what I tell them so that the idea of blowing air through the instrument and then putting it into a smaller tube creates the vibration. I want them to have that idea. The, the lips don't buzz to create a vibration. Air being blown through a small tube creates the vibration and that's what I want them to really get out of this. The other way that I explain it to them, if you wanted to use this one, is we talk about having the entire school, uh, all of the students in the whole school out on the playground and they're all spread out and they have all this room, but if we took every single person and crammed them into one hallway and then I pushed one of them and energized one of them, they'd all start bouncing against each other and the whole room would go crazy and they all have fun imagining what's gonna happen with that. So there's the difference, is we get a vibration and we get excitement from blowing air into a small tube. So it's magic, okay? So I'll show you that again. So let's say that you show the students this step and most of the class is getting it, but there's still a couple of students who are not getting a vibration. They might sound like this. So there's no vibration, but you can still hear air moving through and their lips, <clears throat> their armature looks mostly like what you think it ought to look like. There are a couple of problems that could be having, happening. Um, the first one is that possibly their aperture is too tall and too big. To fix that issue, uh, I tell the students, okay, while you're blowing your air, I want you to gradually and carefully and, and slowly let your lips start coming closer and closer together. And sometimes what happens is this, they'll do this. and they'll get that vibration and it's a little bit delayed. So then you just tell them, okay, the way you ended, you need to make sure and try to start that the next time. And they'll start doing that kind of thing. <clears throat> it may take more time than that, but that's kind of the same idea. So the aperture is too tall. We've got to make sure that the aperture is paper thin. The second thing that could be happening is that their lips in the middle are too tight. And so they're not going to vibrate because they're just, they're just too tight. So they're getting something like this. So what I tell those students <clears throat> is make sure the corners of your mouth are hugging your teeth and giving your teeth a gentle hug, but let the middle of your lips relax. Um, and, and usually what happens is they have to get a feel for that. They can even physically just touch the corners of their mouth like this and then uh, start to relax the lips. And sometimes that will fix the issue and they'll start vibrating from there. Another problem that I see is that the students have too much pressure, especially on the top lip. So the mouthpiece pressure is pushing into their face too hard and too firmly. And so that disallows the lips from vibrating the way that we'd really like them to be where they're free. So um, if they're pushing, if you think they're pushing too much on just the top lip, you can slightly angle down and uh, you can tell them, hey, you can push on the bottom lip a little bit more, but let's make sure that the top lip is free to vibrate. One more thing that, that sometimes happens is that the top lip, we talked about this earlier, the top lip is not coming down past where the, top, the bottom of the top teeth are. And so they're trying to blow through, the teeth are in the way, and you can see my teeth right there. 
and the bottom lip is coming up to it. So to fix that one, you make sure that their top lip is still a flat mustache, slightly curled red, and the corners are set. But we just want to make sure that the top lip is slightly coming down past where the bottom of the top teeth are. If we have an open airway with a wind tunnel and we have our lips set up in the right position where we're blowing through a flat paper thin hole and our lips are muppeting, okay, with no tensions, just the shape of the lips that they understand that they're creating, we should get that vibration. And we do talk about lip tension and the, the, the fact that we want as little as possible. And I show them, I show them this trick. I have my hand. This is a shape of my hand. If I change the shape, Am I, am I straining? Am I trying really hard to get this shape of my hand? No. I'm getting these shapes of my hand by just making different shapes. So I'm making all these shapes of my hand. It's not me gripping and making things tight and trying to, oh, I got a thumbs up. Yeah, cool. It's just me making those shapes. And so we talk about how the lips work the same way. We make a shape of the lips and we blow air across that. It's not tense, it's relaxed. And if we shape the lips properly, we can get all kinds of notes um, doing different things and we talk about that here in a little bit. So the next thing that you're going to want to do with them They've they've taken their mouthpiece and they've added the straw gradually and they've learned how Creating a wind tunnel and blowing that with the correct embouchure through the mouthpiece adding that into a tube Excites the air molecules and vibration begins to occur um, it doesn't matter whether the lips are vibrating or whether the air is vibrating. There's a whole mess of debate about that and people believe whatever they want to believe. What's happening as far as the students are concerned is air is moving, the molecules get excited, vibration happens, okay? And it and it happens accidentally. So the thing that I didn't talk about yet that I really need to, to really reinforce is that they create a sound, they create tone accidentally and we make sure that everybody understands you don't get a sound on purpose. If you do it on purpose, you're doing it wrong. If you do it by accident, by blowing air through through an, an open O-shaped breathing and good embouchure, and you're blowing air through the mouthpiece, and you add that tube, and it suddenly starts vibrating, it should be like a surprise because it should be like magic. You're not trying to do it. It's happening on accident, so accidental vibration. And whenever we get that idea going, then I tell them, you, you know, that's how you know if you're doing it right, is that you're getting a vibration without trying, okay? And we do want the vibration to be a higher pitch. If we're getting... Then I would say, look back at their lips. Watch my lips when I'm doing that. They're pooched out, and we don't want them to be pooched out. We want them to be flat. We automatically get higher pitches whenever we do that, and it's not with tension. It's just with a good shape of the lip, like we were talking about a minute ago, where we're shaping our hand different ways. Okay, so the next part of this is that we start <clears throat> practicing starting a sound by breathing in and blowing, just like all the other steps. Except now the the straw is added to our trumpet or to our mouthpiece, and it's permanently attached. We're not gradually adding it. I don't do the gradually adding thing very much because it ends up being a frustration for them trying to figure it out, and they end up doing weird things trying to get it to all work. Um, <coughs> so that's that. I get to this step as quickly as possible, which is just breathing and playing. <laughs> And I want them to really be working on an open, steady, loud sound. And we go around the room and make sure everybody can do that. And if we've done all the steps right up to that point and everybody's like rocking on all the other stuff previous to that, this step is also really, really easy for them to get going. Now, there are some students, even this year, we've had a couple of students that just had trouble getting themselves to actually do the, the, the embouchure correctly and blow their air correctly because they're wanting to make a sound. Their, their mind is telling them, I gotta make a sound, I gotta make a sound, and they'll do anything to make a sound, but you have to reinforce with them, okay, you gotta make a sound, but you gotta make a sound the right way. So remember, you get some time, like it might take you a few days to get this, and you need to be patient with them so that they can, they can do that um, effectively and correctly and not just get a noise because if they get a noise the next step is not going to go very well for them they've got to get it correctly um, so I hope that's all been clear and everything up to this point has been clear as well so there's that the next thing we're doing is we're going to add the trumpet to what we're doing so here we go
So I taught them how to hold the instrument properly, whatever you want them to be doing. Um, I don't need to go into all that because everybody's got their different opinions about some different minor things and they don't really matter in the scope of what we're trying to talk about right now. So we've taught them how to hold the instrument properly. We're going to make sure that they make everything the same. Their breathing is the same. They're going to be really excited this first time to play their first note and they're going to try to do things that are weird. So you really have to prepare them mentally. Hey, remember all the steps that we've done so far. It is so important that you do all the steps exactly the same way that we've been doing them and that you don't change anything. We need them to work the same way. So far, everybody has been doing a really good job of all the steps. Okay, So we need our sound to be happening accidentally. The vibration happens accidentally because we are breathing and blowing proper air through the proper shape of our lips. Okay, um, And I don't remember if I said this on the last step when we started putting the mouthpiece on the straw, but you do need to tell them to lick their lips, wet their lips, and wet the mouthpiece. Okay, so here's the order of what happens. Left hand goes up, right hand goes up. Then you tell them, lick your lips, lick the mouthpiece. Then you're going to set the embouchure. Then you're gonna breathe, and then you're gonna blow air. And so the idea is that they're getting an accidental sound with a breath attack, um, not using a tongue to start the note yet, because we haven't learned how to do that yet. <clears throat> so the sounds that you hear might be surprisingly good. The sounds that you hear might be surprisingly disheartening. It doesn't really matter because you need to let them try a lot of times to get the feel for it. And they're going to be so excited about getting a sound that you need to make sure and, and reinforce the idea that the sound sounds like what you are sounding like hopefully what you are sounding like, and not just getting a noise and making a good, open, steady, loud tone. And you've got that, those three things that you're always got a checklist and you're asking them, okay, do you hear me doing that? Okay, make sure you're doing that too. Open, steady, loud, open, steady, full, whatever you want to say. But it's something that they can grasp onto. <coughs> it's something they can grasp onto and that they can always be asking themselves. And I think that really gets the the their minds engaged in what they sound like rather than just making a noise. Super important. I know I sound like a broken record, but you kind of have to be a broken record when you're doing this kind of stuff. Let's talk about the sounds that you're going to hear. You're going to hear some students play a G, like a like let's talk trumpet for a second. You're going to hear them play a G or you might hear them play a low C below that. You might hear them play a, a C a third space C. You might hear them play a fourth space E. You may hear them play uh, a G above that E and I have had students play high B flats and high C's before as their first notes. Usually if they're playing that high like a B flat or a C like a B flat seventh harmonic um, if they're playing a high B flat or a C they're too tense and they need to relax a little bit but it's really easy to get them to relax they just fall down and their lips just relax a little bit and they start falling down into ranges that are more appropriate I don't like my students to start out playing low C, even though it's okay whatever comes out at first. I encourage them to try to do things that are going to get them to be playing a second line G or a third space C. Um, I'm okay with E above that and G above that, but low C is, here's why I have a problem with low C. When You can play a low C with a bad embouchure. You can put your lips way out, you can do some weird things, and you can get a really relaxed low C sound with a bad embouchure. It's way harder to get a G to come out or a C above that to come out with a bad embouchure, with a good sound. Okay, so <clears throat> I hope that makes sense. But that is my opinion, and and that's all it is. You can take it for whatever you want. There are amazing, great teachers who would totally disagree with that, and I wouldn't argue with them much. I just say, okay, that's cool. Um, but that's what I want, and that's what I think is going to help develop their range better. Uh, in the long run and it's because of the shape of the embouchure that I'm teaching them to use with that curly top lip. Um, it's very common for me to hear this from students as their first note. Or those are those are what I hear uh, and even this year in my classes right now already those are pretty common sounds across the group. It is less common using this method that I hear this. And you can see my lips 
to create those bad sounds we get the lips forward and pooched out to get them playing with better sounds we get the top lip the mustache flat the top lip is slightly curly or you're gonna get that G or you're gonna get low C and you'll get both of those notes and both of those are okay any note that they get when they start out is okay I do want them to be moving to a G I probably killed that one to death or that whole idea to death so um, you're gonna hear some crazy sounds crazy crazy sounds but you're also gonna be really impressed with some of the sounds that you hear and I think you'll hear more good sounds than scary sounds uh, using that process and the scary sounds are the ones that you really want to go to those students and let them play a lot of times and give them feedback about what they're doing well and what they need to change a little bit and you can fall back on those other steps and say okay I'm looking at this kid I see that his corners of his mouth are wrapping around the trumpet mouthpiece I see this a lot when they start trying to play instead of and and they're perfectly fine when they do all the other steps they're going but as soon as they try to play on the trumpet, they're once again, they're trying to make a sound. They're trying to make a noise, and they're not thinking about what they're doing. And they start doing things like that, like that. The funnest thing you can do as a teacher, I think, too, is like go try to make the bad sounds that your students are making and get good at making those bad sounds because you're going to figure out what they're doing in some cases and be able to help them fix it. Um, so that's a really valuable thing every single day. I go through every single step. I spend very little time at this point in the year we're um, About to finish the fifth fifth week of this first six weeks of school. So we're in the fifth week of school I I don't spend very much time on the earlier steps We just do them because they've already mastered them. They just need reminders um, We what we do spend a lot of time on is playing on the trumpet So after they've learned how to make a sound, you need to go back and you need to teach them how to tongue. Um, and because tonguing is a really important thing in, in helping them to create a good sound. And we'll talk about that more here in a second. Let me show you the how, like what, what I have them do. So we go back to the mouthpiece blowing on the shank. We put that between our teeth. We're going we're gonna to do the same kind of things as far as blowing air, except we're going to have a little bit of a sequence. So we breathe in. Then what I tell them is we're going to place our tongue over the hole. The tip of our tongue is going to go over the hole of the mouthpiece, okay? And we're blocking the air, okay? And then we're going to blow air. And so there's there's this air pressure behind it, but there's nothing happening. It's kind of like we make a big joke about using a river dam. And so we say, hey, we've got to dam it. So we're going to dam the air. And they all think I'm crazy and wild. Ha ha, because I'm using the word dam. But anyways, we've got the tongue over the hole. We're going to blow our air behind that. No air is leaking out. And then when, are we gonna, when, when I say we're going to do it, when I say we're going to do it, we're going to release the tongue. We're going to pull it off of that hole rapidly and the airstream will start so I can't I wish I had somebody else here that could like say the steps but what I'm telling them while they're doing this is each step I'm gonna say okay mouthpiece in your mouth between your teeth you're gonna breathe in you're gonna put the tongue over the hole blow release and so I'll show you each of those so here we go I'm gonna show you let me see if I can do this one is breathe two is tongue three is blow four is release Okay, here I go. Breathe in. And we're still still focusing on all those same things. Maximum air, blowing air steady, open wind tunnel, all of that stuff. Lips are muppeting closed. Everything is still applying. And I'm reminding of them of those things and being really persistent about them. Still even talking about posture constantly. Always, always, always. Never let anything slide. Okay, so the, the process is breathe in, tongue over the hole, blow, release. Pull the tongue off. When we say release, we're talking about pulling the tongue off. So TBR, and you can even abbreviate like that as long as they understand what you're doing. But I actually go down the line, and I have every single student show me what they're doing right off the bat because most of them will do it really well and you don't have to spend a lot of time working on it so the next step is pretty important and i get to ask the students an important question but we just do it without anything so now we've got nothing to aim for except we're making our embouchure and we're breathing in we're tonguing blowing releasing like this here i go 
And actually, I think you can see that where my tongue was blocking the airway and then pulling it out of the way, but my lips aren't moving. So you have to make sure and establish with the students that their tongue doesn't go through their lips. That doesn't work. Uh, and, and they know that too if they really thought about it, but usually they're not thinking about it. So I tell them that the tip of the tongue goes right under the top teeth and no further, just enough to block the air. And you breathe in, you tongue, blow, release. Okay, And I'm still going that speed, kind of slow like that, so that they're really getting the sequence of things that are going on. Okay, So here are some things that you can tell them that help them figure out how to do that. Um, one of the things is I tell them, okay, pretend like you have a watermelon seed. It's on the tip of your tongue. And this watermelon seed is special. It's got a par parachute attached to it. And I want you to spit that watermelon seed out, and I want you to blow it across the room. But you have to use a trumpet officer to do it. So they're going to sit up tall. They're going to gauge and everything. Doing, still doing all this stuff. They're going to breathe in. And they're blowing that watermelon seed across the room with that parachute. And the reason for the parachute is just so that they get air behind what they're doing and that they're blowing it in a steady fashion. Still, open, steady, loud. That's the mantra always. Always, always. You're driving everybody crazy with it. I drive myself crazy with it too. Um, so there's how to tongue. Another thing that I tell them is, anybody in here bite their fingernails? And then uh, some hands go up because it's a safe space and everybody's honest and it's funny and stuff. I raise my hand because I bite my fingernails too. Nasty habit. Well, what happens when you bite that fingernail off? You're not going to eat it, so you got to spit it out. So it's in your mouth. How do you get rid of it? You don't go... <laughs> you don't do that. You're going to spit it out. And you're going to kind of spit it in a specific direction. <laughs> you spit it out. Well, pretend like that thing has a, has a parachute on it. Now you've got this going on and they've articulated cleanly. They've got a steady airstream behind it and you've got a, a solid articulation going. The last one I tell them is for the people, and there's always a few people, some, usually some girls, they're like, I don't buy my fingernails. And so it's like, okay, well, have you ever had an eyelash or like a piece of hair get on your tongue or something and you want to get rid of it, right? You don't go blah, 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 and try to get rid of it. You just put on the tip of your tongue and then you spit it out. Well, put some air behind it. Now you know how to tongue. So it's the same kind of idea, but you've already established it with this. So it's just reinforcing it and trying to get them to do it without actually having something there to put their tongue on except for their teeth. Now here's the important question that you ask the students um, whenever they do this is you say, okay, when you're doing that, what does your tongue feel? And the answer that we get is sometimes, it's rarely, it's rarely the teeth, although the tongue does feel the teeth slightly. Usually the answer that I get, and it's the correct answer, is that the students feel the top lip. They fill their top lip with the tip of their tongue. And that's exactly what you want them to do. They, they should be able to lightly feel their top lip between their teeth. But that's how you can be sure that the tongue is in the right position. You should be able to feel lightly. You should be able to feel the top lip with the tip of your tongue. Okay, and you get that pop to the beginning of the note, not an accent kind of a pop, but a, just a really clean, like you're snapping your fingers, really clean pop to the beginning of the note when that starts. And so the students are looking for that. So daily we practice tongue blow release on the hole or on the, the back of the shank of the mouthpiece. And then we take that away and we're blowing and doing that with just air and just our embouchure, air and embouchure. And then the next step is putting that on the trumpet and just getting them to do the same stuff, make it the same. That's our that's our idea. And the sound should be open, steady, and loud, just like all the other steps, but we're getting a clean articulation. And usually the students immediately catch this concept, and it's not something that you have to reteach. I don't have very many problems where kids don't understand what they're doing. I'll show you one more trick. Um, with this though to help teach them in case they're not understanding because sometimes they just don't get the sequencing down of the tongue blow release So there's a serious way which is the real way and then there's the silly way So the silly way is to breathe in then you stick your tongue out Then you blow Then you pull the tongue out of the way. So here's the whole sequence And they get the idea that that's going on and they it of course looks stupid as you just saw and they have a lot of fun doing that one but it gets the sequence and it gets the idea of what's happening in that order going on and then i say okay now do it the real way the serious way as if you were playing your trumpet 
and they start closing the gap of how long that process takes to where it all becomes one fluid motion. And before you know it, your students are going and able to just start a note with no problem. So that's that's the cool thing with that one, and that's how I teach articulation, and it's it's been really, really successful with my students. Okay, we're back with the last segment segment of what I'm talking about today, and, and this is going to take you into uh, what you would want to be doing in your method book. As soon as you're done with this stuff, you're actually, from the last step, once you know how to tongue, you're ready to get into your method book. But getting into moving around on different notes, that's the last step for a trumpet player or a French horn player to be able to master the skills that they need to really get going on their instrument. And the last one is moving up and down on the instrument because every note that we play has to have a center of pitch. So the vibration that occurs has to be the exact same pitch that we're trying to play. Otherwise we get distortions in the sound or we crack notes or um, we might, um, the note sounds dead if we're playing on the high side of the note, like sharp on the note, or it sounds flabby if we're playing on the low side of the note. So in order for us to play the center of tone, we also have to find the center of pitch. Um, and the vibration that our lips are creating has to be that same pitch. So here's how I get my students to start being able to do that. We take the straw and the mouthpiece, we add them together, and we're still doing all these steps every day, so you just add this in to what you're doing once you've learned how to do it. You add this in to your steps, and you're still going sequentially from, uh, well, I'll show you at the end. I'll show all the steps in order so you can see what we're doing. But you still go sequentially through <clears throat> all the steps, but you add this into it. So here we go. Um, I just let them try to make a, a note happen and then let it fall down lower. But the, the stipulation that I give them, the rule that I give them, is that it's still got to be open, steady, and loud the whole time. So what you'll hear is this. When they start trying to do this and they bend the note down like they're doing sirens, like, like I did when I was a sixth grader, we'd do sirens on our mouthpiece up and down. And we'd learn how to do that with our vertical motion. We're doing it because we don't believe in buzzing on just the mouthpiece. We like the resistance of the tube. We're doing it on this thing. And what we do is we play a note and we fall down. What you're going to hear a lot of your students do is this. And their air is going to slow way down and they're going to get a way softer sound as they go lower. You need to try to really get them to play loud the whole time from high to low. And and this is not a perfect instrument and so it, it doesn't feel perfect but it establishes the idea and the feeling of what's happening. So we're going high to low, staying loud the whole time. And they echo that back to me, loud the whole time, like a Magic School Bus episode or something. So, and we're just going high to low. And high to low just means whatever note they play, go lower from there. They don't have to try to play a really high note. We don't want to do that. We just want to start with what's comfortable and bend the note slightly down, keeping it loud the whole time. Well, here's the question that the students sometimes have if they're not able to do that. How do I do that? So you've already talked a lot about the shape of the lips and the embouchure and how it works. The thing that I like the most is telling them, okay, you know how you're blowing through a paper thin hole? Try to make it a cardboard thin hole so it's a little bit thicker. Um, and what they end up doing is they open up that aperture let me see if I can demonstrate this just with a lip buzz. You can see my lips curling out. And also, you can't see this, but the aperture is actually getting a little bit taller. It's very slight. But the aperture, the hole that I'm blowing through is a little bit taller. The lips are curling out slightly. <clears throat> and I'm relaxing my embouchure while still keeping a strong airstream. So high to low is all about those those types of things. Now most of the time they can do that just by feel. They don't actually have to be told how to do that. Um, but if they do need a little help and some instruction on how to get that going, after trying it a few times, you can give them those suggestions. Something that I really try to reinforce with my brass students is that as they're going lower, they also have to make the inside of their mouth 
taller and more like a bigger cave on the inside uh, of their mouth because if they don't do that they end up getting really pinched sounds in the lower ranges because their oral cavity is not tall enough and big enough to really resonate. Now that they're able to do that and remember that this is probably some time into your class um, in terms of days like you've had several days of being able to do all the steps previous to this now you're going to take your instrument and they're they're probably starting to be able to actually play a G in the staff or maybe even a C in the staff if they're having trouble getting low enough. I don't tend to worry about it too much because falling down lower obviously is the easier thing to do than going up, which is also another reason why I like them to start on G rather than low C. Sometimes it's hard for them to get up to the G. Um, but anyways, so then we start playing and we're going to slur down. So we tongue. We articulate the beginning of the note, we get a note established, and then we fall down. I don't like using foot tap and, and worrying about rhythm when we're doing this. I just want to play a note and fall down to another note. So here we go. And they can feel what happened. You don't have to even explain it. If they can do it on the mouthpiece and the, and the straw, they can probably do it on their trumpet pretty easily. Now the goal becomes, okay, can you do that without having the hee-haw, the donkey sound, in between the notes? Because we want to play from center of pitch down to the center of the next pitch, and we want to change notes cleanly. And that's a lot of playing a brass instrument, is just being able to move around from center of pitch to center of pitch without having a lot of stuff in between. And so we're trying to move back and forth cleanly, and they're getting better at moving back and forth cleanly and without a lot of hee-haw donkey sounds in between. The last thing that you do, and they're ready to start rocking and rolling on just about anything at this point, starting to build range and all that stuff, but once they can go down, then you get them to go back up. And this is the trickiest thing to get them to do. Um, but it's conceptually, it's simple. So we go down. And then we say, okay, let's go back where we came from. And usually most students can figure out, oh, I just do the opposite with my lips or my embouchure that I did to get lower. I just go back where I came from. And that's exactly what they do. And by now they've developed enough awareness of what's going on and control with what's going on that they can actually do that. So the students who have trouble, if you tell them, so the student, there's the students that get it, and they go down, and then they come back up easily. You don't have to worry about those students, obviously. The students that you're concerned with are the ones that go down, and they stay down, and they can't come back up. So what do you tell them? What suggestions do you give them? Well, open steady loud the whole time. Keep their airflow really moving, and make sure that they've got that open wind tunnel that they're blowing through. That's, that's the most important thing. The second thing is, well, when you went lower, your lips slightly rolled out and the paper thin hole got taller and your lips got a little bit more relaxed. So if you want to go back higher, you do the opposite. You start curling those lips back in slightly. You blow through a smaller, more paper thin hole rather than cardboard. And you also start to firm up the corners of the lips. Okay? I'm not going to ever say tight. Um, I don't want to use the word tight because we're always talking about everything being relaxed and being a shape. But that's th those are things that I tell them, and those are usually things that get them going there. Once again, you've got to be patient. It's going to take time. It might take days. It might take weeks before a student is able to go back up. But that's, that, that's the easiest thing for them to do is just do it on this first and master that. going back where they came from. And then it's just a matter of putting it on the instrument <clears throat> and having them slur from like a G to a low C and then back to a G. And you, of course it's just a matter of playing it more and more cleanly every single time uh, and getting them to change quickly between the two once they get a feel for it. 
So it's going to be ugly at the start whenever they, they first start doing that in most cases. But like I said, you just be patient and you help them to be patient too because they're going to be really hard on themselves unless you are encouraging and like saying things like, hey, it's okay. We're going to try it again tomorrow and it might work and it might not, but we're going to get it eventually. I know you're going to get it. And you got to make sure and really believe in them and have confidence in them and they're going to have more confidence in themselves. They're going to keep trying to do it and they're not going to give up. So... That's the beginning of the year as far as the trumpet and French horn class goes. Of course, uh, I came at this from a trumpet perspective. French horn just is a little bit different in terms of the harmonics and the notes that we're aiming for um, and a little bit of the, the mouthpiece placement and a little bit of the embouchure, um, but those changes are different. But the process is still all the same. Use the same process for both classes. I just kind of make it the make it its own for whatever instrument that we're needing to, to use it on. Um, so I really hope this has helped you. Um, I know this is a lot of information, uh, but I hope it's detailed enough that you won't have a lot of questions about it um, to where things are confusing. The last part of this video is going to be an example of our daily drill, our, and uh, we call it our trumpet routine. Once the students have learned all of the steps that we've talked about in this video, then it's just a matter of maintaining that and also improving all of each of the steps uh, to where they're really mastering every little detail. Um, and that's going to carry over into their playing, uh, hopefully in some really, really effective ways. First thing is posture check. Double check that feet are flat on the floor. Body is on the front edge of the chair. The back is straight and the student's heads are looking straight forward. If we're good, we move right on to the next thing which is breathing. So we're gonna breathe in for two counts and blow out for four counts. We do use the metronome on all of these, but I'm not going to for the sake of this video. I'm just demonstrating what we're doing and the order that we're doing it. So two count breath always whenever they're doing any of the activities that we're doing. Next step is the McDonald's straw, sitting on top of the tongue. That one, they run out of air really fast because there's not very much resistance from the tube. Next step is the mouthpiece visualizer. Okay, the next step is the mouthpiece <clears throat> and we're gonna blow on the shank. And from this step on, we use tongue blow release. We're going to articulate the beginnings of every single note. The next step is blowing through the rim of the mouthpiece. The next step is adding the large straw that's like the lead pipe. So we call it our plastic trumpet. We do this for four beats. Open steady loud all the time on every single step. Okay, next is to still use this. We're going to go from high to low, keeping it loud the whole time. Next step is high, low, high. Not too worried about timing on these two exercises where we're moving up and down on the straw. Just trying to get it smooth and loud the whole time. Then we're done with this stuff. We're going to go on to the trumpet. We'll start with a whole note G. Two count breath, reminding them of maximum air. Uh, open steady loud. Okay, we're good on that. We're going to go on to the next step, which is going from high to low. And the last step, playing G, moving down to C, moving back to G. <clears throat> okay, 
So that's the end of the routine, and uh, that will take us to the end of this video. I really, really hope that this information is useful to you and effective for your students. I hope it helps them if you choose to use any of it. Thank you very much, and good luck in your teaching.